Welcome to this month's installment of Brass Chats, brought to you by Monster Oil. What is this? 21 year? Hi everybody, welcome to Brass Chats. Today we're sitting down with Mr. Leroy Jones, right here in New Orleans, Louisiana. He's played all over the world. He's uh, formerly a member of the original Hurricane Brass Band, the Preservation Hall Jazz Band, and spent 17 years as solo trumpet with Harry Connick Jr.'s Big Band. Thanks so much for joining us, Leroy. Thanks, Tom. Thanks for having me. You're a member of several different bands. I think I counted six different bands that you're officially a member of. How do you balance wearing all of these different hats and like all these different styles of music you're playing? How do you balance all that? Well. Uh, I have the Leroy Jones Quintet, of course, yeah. uh, and that's a five, of course, a five-piece band with myself and Katia on trombone, and then usually it's piano, bass, and drums, mm -hmm. and uh, the first string, I guess you could call those musicians who are with the band most of the time, unless they have to do something else and we, they get a sub, mm -hmm. would be Megan Swartz on piano and then a Mitchell Player on bass, who's been my bass player uh, since 2001. He's been playing oh, okay. with me, and uh, he was on a record called Back to My Roots. It was the first record I independently produced after I had been away from Columbia since Props for Pops, the second record. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And I, I, I didn't do anything as a soloist between 1996 or 97 and 2000 and, uh, I guess so. 2002. Yeah, yeah. So 2002, Back to My Roots came, and, uh, mm -hmm. and then I did you know, the brass band record. Uh, yeah. The Hurricane Brass Band is actually a brass band that uh, was founded in 1974. Yep. And uh, Danny Barker, right? Well, actually, yeah, Danny gave us the name, and you know, actually, the Fairview Baptist Church Brass Band or the March Bra Fairview Baptist Church right. Marching Band was yeah, before yeah. Uh -huh. that band and was organized in 1970. Okay. And that was d through my direct. Uh, uh, relationship with Danny mm -hmm. and then the pastor Reverend Andrew Darby of the Family Baptist Church which was about 50 meters from my house my parents house when I used to practice in the garage for hours oh, cool. and Danny lived around the corner and 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 I didn't even I knew Mr. Barker was my neighbor but I didn't know of his fame and of uh -huh. his musical uh, status you know you see the neighbors you say good evening how you doing he passed by the, <laughs> and during during that time I had been playing the trumpet for two years already then and uh, in school band and taking private lessons once a week uh, with an uh, instructor mm -hmm. you know and and I played really loud then as most kids do when they first start playing <laughs> yep. brass so you could hear my horn three blocks away even <laughs> with the windows down at the house yeah. you know. but I would usually have the garage still cracked or open because uh, in my neighborhood, a lot of uh, young people played in band. Mm -hmm. So often, you know, after the other kids were free from their homework, or, or, or they, their parents said it was okay for them to come out, the, some that lived just around the corner, some that lived maybe two or three blocks away, we'd gravitate towards each other and get into the garage and play along uh, with records or, or, or play, you know, with each other. Uh -huh. uh, and a couple of the guys were members of Fairview, uh, of the Fairview Baptist Church. So uh, Danny, when the pastor asked him to put a band together, I was one of the first recruits. Mm -hmm. And Danny Barker saw that I was serious about music and that, and he noticed my talent and he appointed me as, as the leader of that band. Uh -huh. So how I old was, were you at the time? Uh, I was 12 years old. Oh my gosh, and, uh, you led so a band 13, at 12. So, yeah, <laughs> so then, the, the, then uh, about uh, two years, well actually four years later, uh, 1974, Danny had to uh, cut uh, the umbilical cord for, of, of the Fairview Baptist Church band for various reasons that I won't get into. Okay. But um, <laughs> he did, and he said, look, I'm going to call you guys a hurricane because when y'all come up the street, y'all blow like a storm. <laughs> so so uh, we became then Leroy Jones Hurricane Brass Band. Tell me some good Danny Barker stories. What was he like? What? What I admired most about Mr. Barker and his wife, Blue Lou Barker, who was a great jazz singer also, mm -hmm. uh, and um, is that they always took their time with the children in the neighborhood. Uh, 
I guess sort of like what Louis Armstrong did. You know, you've mm -hmm. seen those pictures of Louis with the kids on his step in, in Corona, in Queens, you know. Yeah. But he takes a, a moment showing them a few things on the horn or, or just telling them uh, good stories about life. And, uh, yeah. And, and, and that's, that's the way Danny was. Uh, what were some of the things you remember him telling you? I remember really he, you? Would, he told me the most important thing that I remember him telling me is that whenever you go out to perform, Always smile and have yourself dressed properly. <laughs> and, and even if something is bothering you, remember that the people who are coming to hear that music, uh, it does something for them because uh, many of them are not always feeling their best, but it's, uh, the music will take them to a different place. Hmm. Now, who was your biggest musical influence as a young man? Um, my biggest influence would have been Louis Armstrong for off, right off the bat mm -hmm. because his sound caught my ear even before I picked up a musical instrument. Oh, okay. And uh, yes. the okay. parents always played records, recordings, uh, LPs and, and 78s around the house. Mm -hmm. And some of those records were the Louis Armstrong uh, records. What were your uh, favorite records? Uh, well, there was a record uh, uh, of Louis uh, with uh, the all-star band, uh, I think it would have been maybe 1958. Oh, okay. There was a, a, the cadenza that he plays at the end of, of Ain't Misbehaving after he sings. You know, I don't know that one. Bit, 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 and he ends up on a high F above high C at the end. <laughs> and it's something because there are earlier versions of him doing Ain't Misbehaving, uh -huh. where it's the solo, almost not the same solo, but you can hear that he's over the years how he's perfected him on himself. Yeah. And he's perfected his solo. You know, oftentimes a lot of people say, oh, they, <clears throat> the guys are playing the same solo every, you know. The process of improvisation is okay. Improvisation is spon spontaneity is an important part of, of improvisation, but you have a cadence of different things you play of in, in musical vocabulary. Mm -hmm. So it's an accumulation of a lot of different ideas that you have played or that you have heard that have never been played, uh, and and certain things that you have run over during your practice regimen. Your first notes on the trumpet, did you play more like, like Arbin book stuff or did you start playing well, start, jazz? Started Bellwin Elementary, just sure, like yeah, every yeah, kid. Yeah. Bellwin Intermediate, Bellwin Progressive, <laughs> same way like other kids. So in playing the little tunes that were in the book, you know, that, yeah. and, and learning your scales that way. But I could play by ear already yeah. without, you know, I could play things that I heard, you know, at the drop of a, of a hat. So do you, you have perfect know. pitch? Oh, I don't claim to, I, you know, my pitch is pretty good. Oh, I don't okay, know, yeah. You know, <laughs> sure. you know, I mean, I mean, a lot of times it's perfect. Sometimes it's a little bit off, you know, <laughs> I, you know, yeah. I, you know but I, I can play what I hear and I could always do that. And, uh, and I know what note I'm supposed to play in my head before it comes out of the horn, which you should. And if you, now, you, you know, noticed you play, that at an early age you were able you, to do that, at a young well, age. Well, yeah, because, I mean, I think that that's important as far as you playing in tune and, and also playing, you know, if you're going to play what you hear, you know, you, you have to be able to, to hear it and then hear it in, inside before it comes out. It's, if you're playing a wind instrument, it's not going to just come out there magically just pressing the first valve down and think that you're going to play an, an, an F or, or D or, or whatever note that chord, coincides with that fingering. Mm -hmm. But you have to have a pitch. It's, you know, it's much easier to go to the piano and say, okay, I see what a C is. Bam, just touch it. And it's there, you know. That's uh, one of those things I really admire about you, and, and you hear it among the great players, like like Satch, for example. His singing was just like his trumpet playing, and I find the same with you. Your singing is very similar to your well, trumpet playing. And well, I think drives yeah, towards what you were saying. Well, uh, I mean, it's the same spirit that's driving. You mm -hmm. know, it's the same individual. I mean, if you played, if you became proficient on any instrument of your choice, to some degree. Uh, according to what that instrument allows uh, and according to your proficiency of playing it, you're going to play. You're still expressing yourself. It's, mm -hmm. So it's just using a different instrument to do it. And the voice is an instrument too. Let's talk, oh, we're kind of all over the map right here. Let's talk about some nerdy trumpet stuff. Back <laughs> from the beginning. Um, 
What were you practicing when you made your biggest strides on the trumpet? What kind of things were you doing in your garage every single day when you made the most well, progress? Well, I think I made the most progress uh, early on in the first, within the first five to ten years of playing uh, the trumpet. Uh, uh, was practicing uh, lip slurs, learning to master lip trills, mm -hmm. and uh, learning to uh, have a bit of control over the staccato tonguing, uh, which were essential. Yeah, those I found that lip trill was not an easy thing to do, mm -hmm. and to get into saying the syllable oi oi and not waffle waffle waffle. <laughs> you yeah, know? So, because you know. I mean, in essence, you are. Uh, using that instrument to speak mm -hmm. sort of a, a course in the musical language yeah so all of, there are many different ways to approach uh, attacking a note uh, phrasing a note to you can play the same note but it it just sounds different because you 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 the way you attack it mm -hmm. you know you don't have to use tongue always mm -hmm. you could say ha huh, instead of ta mm -hmm. and 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 li instead of ta Sort of lift, uh, lift, lift it's that <laughs> sort of has a th yeah. type of thing. You probably heard that a lot of bebop trumpet players with, th th lift, yeah, lift, yeah. Lift, 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 you know, sort of that's what it sounds like. Uh -huh. But I mean, it's sort of getting the tongue caught up between the uh, in, with the airflow and getting the tongue in the way of the air between the top and bottom teeth. Now you took these these lessons once a week, uh, studying the Arvin book and all this stuff. Bellwin, how did you come about breaking these rules that you were taught in these lessons to, to come up with a lit tongue and all these well, different things? Well, that was from listening to records. You know, yeah. when I got my first Clifford Brown record, when I got when I started listening to Freddie Hubbard, mm -hmm. uh, you know, first listening to Louis Armstrong, mm -hmm. uh, you know, listening to uh, Art Farmer, Shorty Rogers, those some of the early. Uh, trumpet players I heard on record, mm -hmm. uh, on recording, uh, and eventually meeting Freddie Hubbard when I was 18 and he was in town at Rosie's, the oh, jazz yeah? club uptown, and I got to go hear him live. Mm -hmm. And uh, this that would have been 1976, and Freddie had a record out called Bundle of Joy. Okay. And it was more of a commercial uh, recording, uh, nothing like his uh, straight ahead stuff from the late 50s and early 60s, mm -hmm. but it was just a great record, with, and he's of course playing beautifully, you know, jazz lines of all of these funk grooves, you know, mm -hmm. and, uh, and listening to Freddie, even before I got my hands on most of, if not all of the Clifford Brown records that I have, Clifford, and, you know, uh, Kenny Durham and Art Farmer, I mean, um, um, Blue Mitchell, and I mean, I have a whole set. me to another question. Besides Louis Armstrong, who most people consider to be their biggest influence, who would be your biggest influence in, in terms of a modern player? Well, Is prob it Clifford? probably Clifford. Uh, yeah, probably Clifford mm -hmm. and, uh, uh, and Freddie Hubbard. You know, I mean, if Freddie was after Clifford, of course, but uh, just like I'm saying, I, I, I heard Freddie before. If I you say it's like, if you heard Freddie, you heard Clifford. If you heard Clifford, you heard Fast Navarro. Yeah. You know, I have Fast Navarro records now. You know, I got hip to all the, you know, Book a Little and all that. I want yeah. to hear, hear what, how differently, but yet how similar the the dialogue was because, and their their dialect, I should say. So because of those guys from that bebop era, Lee Morgan, of course, too. Yeah. You know, and I got a lot of his things because I love his playing. Now, were and, there a lot of guys in New Orleans listening to these people as well? There, yeah, I'd have to say, you know, Wendell Brunius. I don't know if you know Wendell Brunius, yeah. but he's Wendell also listened to that. And mm -hmm. also, let me tell you about New Orleans trumpet players that I listened to who were influenced older, not my generation, but the generation before me, mm -hmm. and like Theodore Raleigh, Teddy Raleigh, uh, uh, who played. He was a traditional trumpet, trumpet player. He had a great influence on Greg Stafford, too. Mm -hmm. uh, but Teddy was more, even more, more of a modern, if you want to call that modern, which is not modern today because that type of playing is 60 years old or more. Right. But I'm saying uh, they were, let's say they were swing jazz players, you know. Uh -huh. uh, it wasn't Dixieland, it wasn't circus music, you know, mm -hmm. and polkas and stuff <laughs> like that. These cats were swinging and soulful and syncopated and harmonic. You know, and melodic, you know, all together, all of that in one. Uh -huh. uh, so, Teddy, uh, Jack Willis, uh, these men are dead now, but mm -hmm. I got to hear those men live. But, uh, 
and probably because of my association with Danny Barker and the Fairview Band, because often we would come after a gig, we'd sometimes go to the French Quarter, and these guys were still playing on clubs in Bourbon Street. So mm -hmm. you could stand outside, and you know, if you were too young, you didn't have to go in. But there was music throughout the day and evenings at one time on, on Bourbon Street. Yeah. But jazz, street, like jazz bands, a lot of clubs, that's no more, as I'm you know. I'm so jealous. Uh, and so I, I got, I, it, 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 it changed in the early 80s. That's when the, it, it diminished. Uh, really? Yeah. Let's talk a little bit about improvisation. Um, a lot of people I've noticed have a lot of different ways, widely varying ways of teaching improvisation. Um, the two main ones that come to mind for me that I try to balance in my teaching is uh, listening and playing orally and then studying intellectually chord changes and harmonies and so forth. Where do you fit on that spectrum? How do you like to teach improvisation? Well, the key to improvisation is to play with logic and continuity, mm -hmm. which simply means flowing and, and makes sense. You can play with continuity and no logic, and which will become a bunch of mumbo jumbo. Mm -hmm. It has nothing to do with the song. Uh, I think that youngsters who are coming up today need to learn first how to play a melody, then embellish on a melody, then take a song if, if, my, if I'm practicing, which I do still sometimes, I'll take the book, if I, there's something new I'm learning, and I'll have the chords and the melody in front of me on the lead sheet in concert. Mm -hmm. uh, I prefer looking at concert chord changes n instead of m my own yep. and B flat, you know. F and, and, and then I'll play, take the sheet and uh, have a sheet without the melody on it at all and play ideas over the chords that are there mm -hmm. of a song uh, as a practice. Uh, and then, and now with all of the technology today, you can, you know, like if you have this, uh, there's an app that you can get for your iPhone even, it's called uh, 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 Music Tones. Uh, 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 it's uh, iReal. iReal, iReal. Yeah. And you can put in, the, it'll generate a, a sort of like band in a yeah. box. Yeah. But I mean, for standards and, and so forth, uh, a lot of, chords run the same route as sort of like uh, it's a runway that all the planes come through. You know, yeah. they might land a little differently, <laughs> calling yeah. on what's crosswinds and all of this kind of stuff, <laughs> but pretty much they come in the same route. So, you know, that makes you, that's once you build enough repertoire, then you realize, oh, well, that's like so-and-so, that song, or Bill Bailey, well, that's like Bourbon Street Parade, mm -hmm. uh, 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 the changes to, to that, that particular song, you know, that works in that, or Ole Miss is the preaching, you know, mm -hmm. uh, you know, I mean, the, 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 the song Ole Miss is an old, older song, but the harmonic uh, progression there is just like Horace Silver's taken and made the preacher change mm -hmm. it up a little bit. But that's the beauty of jazz. That's, mm -hmm. that's uh, where you take something and you make it your own, you know. Now you do some teaching, right? Every now and then. What's a typical lesson like when you have a kid come in, the first lesson with you, um, and the kid says, I want to learn how to play jazz, Mr. Leroy. How do I do that? What do you, what do, you do with him? Well, first thing, I uh, ask him uh, if he's warmed up already, mm -hmm. if he's playing the trumpet. Usually it's a trumpet student that mm -hmm. comes in. I ask him, how, what is this warm-up method? Because you can never have a satisfying playing experience if you're not warmed up properly before. I mean, your whole evening can be destroyed if you go at it and you didn't warm up properly and you wonder why my chops don't feel right. Mm -hmm. So we deal with that first. And then when that question, uh, com we come back to answering the, qu the question about that, we say, well, we have to listen. We listen to something. We mm -hmm. listen to, for example, an Armstrong uh, playing a ballad. Or we listen to Clifford Brown playing a ballad. Or we listen to Clifford Brown playing his solo on Cherokee mm -hmm. at, at a very fast tempo, which is something that's way beyond what a, you're going to expect a 14-year-old, 15-year-old to do. Mm -hmm. But it's ex because it takes years to develop, unless you're Clifford Brown, right. <laughs> to develop uh, that facility to play like that. And um, But being exposed to it, I think it's important that they're ex you know, that they are exposed to that at, as early as they can. Yeah. Because once you start hearing it, eventually it becomes a part of your musical vocabulary. Mm -hmm. And when he's finally developed enough to play, 
to a certain degree and have a certain facility on that instrument, mm -hmm. those things will come back, you know, those ideas will come up. I mean, yeah. this is how you develop. I mean, it's, and if you have a natural sense of time, that's one battle that you've, uh, you've, 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 you've won mm -hmm. as far as your road to being uh, a, a, a great soloist and improviser. Hmm. Uh, you, and if you're playing jazz, you need to be able to swing, uh, and and not depending on the drummer or the bass player or the piano player to be the one to cause you to swing. Yeah, you know, <laughs> you have to be able to swing if you had to swing play by yourself mm -hmm. and have a sense, in a sense of in in a metronome. Yeah, and uh, what were your biggest struggles on the trumpet? You, you practice, and I used to practice four or five hours a day. Oh yeah, you know when I was a kid. Yeah, <laughs> I practiced minimum three hours when I came. I did my homework. But I was in the garage. We playing, playing psh, to you know. But I loved it. Nobody had to tell yeah. tell me to practice. I loved playing. Mm -hmm. You know. So uh, I put a lot of time in uh, with the first ten years of playing, and ended up developing this sort of bulgingness in my neck on the left side. You know, and I would have been. 22 years old. Yeah. I started changing my embouchure, and and I got went and gave me some pointers. But uh, he had a little apartment. He had they were out with Art Blakey during that time here yeah, in Bradford. Yeah. But he's, you know, I stayed at his place and uh, a couple of nights, you know, before he came in, we hung out and we talked about that. And uh, he, I, he, I see, I said, man, you know, I'm having this issue. You know, I, I could still play and and everything. You know, always and he he said, Lee, you know, I think you should try to change I'm with you, you know, it's gonna be rough. And it was, I mean, a slightly moving the mouth piece over after ten years, changing the point of contact, I lost all my range and you know, I mean I still could you know, I could play a, a G in the A above the staff, but a, a, even the high C was was difficult wow. whereas when I was thirteen, four five I was hitting Fs and G's, you know, when I was mm -hmm. fourteen. Mm -hmm. You know, but then you know, I had to go back to the basics, basically, and started forming a different sort of pucker and getting used to playing with less pressure. Specifically, and it was playing using a more of a buzzing technique in squatting on a diaphragm, understanding how I'm breathing, oh, okay. concentrating on how I'm breathing, you know, and taking deep yoga breaths rather, rather than just shallow thoracic breaths. Oh, yeah. And I just had to be patient and uh, still practice a lot of long tones. Yeah. You know, just strengthening the embouchure and the different, and placing the mouthpiece differently and just getting myself into buzzing and. Oh, without a mouthpiece. Yeah. And doing this sort of thing and knowing that according to how well defined that tone is, that's how, that's how, how defined your tone will be. All right, you ready for the monster round? Mm -hmm. This is the monster round, it's going to be short, Concise answers, first thing that comes to mind, short questions. Mm -hmm. What's your favorite place to play trumpet? Preservation Hall. What instrument would you play if you could do it all over again? Trumpet. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Not including politicians, who do you think would be the best president? Living or dead? <laughs> Doesn't matter. Doesn't matter. Louis <laughs> Armstrong. <laughs> okay, good call. Favorite city besides New Orleans? Bangkok. Ooh. Hardest thing you've ever played? Fly to the Bomba Bees. <laughs> <laughs> okay. What's the best concert band in the world? The United States Coast Guard Band or one of the other ones? The United States Coast Guard Band is the greatest band in the history of man and will remain so until the end of time. If you could lead a band and pick any side men from history, who would be in your band? Hmm. Try Young. Who else? How many choices? The whole band, the whole band. You gotta pick the whole oh, band. Man. <laughs> Winter Kelly. Okay. Paul Chambers. And Jimmy Cobb. Nice. Clifford Brown or Lee Morgan. Who do you like better? Oh, that's that's really difficult. Man. It's a mean question. Okay, that's know. that's really not fair. Okay. <laughs> I I guess I'd have to tend towards Clifford. Sinatra or Nat Cole? Nat Cole. Louis Armstrong or Bach? That's hard. <laughs> That's hard too. I'd have to say Armstrong. Archie or Drew Brees? Drew Brees. Ooh. Least appreciated trumpet player in history? Hmm. 
Idris Suleiman. Oh. If you could only play one more song before you died, what would it be? A song that I have never played? No, no, no. no. Okay. Any song that you could play before you die, what would it be? Old Rugged Cross. Oh, really? Mm. Mr. Leroy Jones, thank you so much for taking the time out. Really appreciate it. You're welcome. It was great meeting you. Talk to you.